Well, the two shirts guy is now the two guilty verdicts guy. Steve Bannon, who always wears two shirts for reasons known only to him, was found guilty on two counts of criminal contempt of Congress in federal court today in Washington, D.C. Former federal prosecutor Glenn Kirshner was in the courtroom and will join us later in this hour with the unsurprising details of those two guilties. Whenever I watch the January 6th committee hearings, especially when it includes video of Donald Trump and his children, I always wonder what Mary Trump is thinking. Mary Trump will tell us exactly what she was thinking last night, watching that hearing when she joins us at the end of the hour tonight. And of course, I always wonder what Harvard Law Professor Lawrence Tribe sees in these hearings. And we are lucky to have him joining us tonight to share his reaction to what we all heard last night. And as we have done after each of these hearings, we will begin our discussion tonight with the legal team of Katyal and Burke, Neil Katyal and Barry Burke, whose expertise will illuminate the most important elements of the testimony last night. The committee announced last night that they will resume public hearings in September because evidence continues to develop and emerge in their investigation. In the course of these hearings, we have received new evidence and new witnesses have bravely stepped forward. Efforts to litigate and overcome immunity and executive privilege claims have been successful and those continue. Doors have opened, new subpoenas have been issued, and the dam has begun to break. The dam has begun to break. Evidence is now pouring into the committee from new sources like the Secret Service. The Secret Service has just completed its worst week since the last week of November 1963 when President John F. Kennedy was assassinated because the Secret Service did not yet know how to protect a president in a motorcade. A week ago, we learned of an investigation of the Secret Service by the Inspector General of the Department of Homeland Security in which the Inspector General discovered the Secret Service had deleted all Secret Service text messages sent and received on January 6th. By the end of this week, the Inspector General announced that his investigation is now a criminal investigation of the Secret Service. The January 6th committee member, Zoe Lofgren, broke the news yesterday in an interview with Nicole Wallace on MSNBC that some Secret Service agents have hired private criminal defense lawyers to represent them in negotiations for their testimony with the January 6th committee. Here's what January 6th committee member Adam Kinzinger said about that today. Now all of a sudden you have these Secret Service members lawyering up and not coming in and talking to us. Congressman Kinzinger said that first thing this morning and in the late afternoon today, the director of the Secret Service, James Murray, finally broke his silence on the worst scandal ever to hit the Secret Service. After one week of total silence, the director of the Secret Service issued a written statement, which was, at this point, very difficult to believe. James Murray said in writing, I am firmly reiterating the commitment of the United States Secret Service in supporting the extraordinary efforts of the January 6th Select Committee. Since day one, I have directed our personnel to cooperate fully and completely with the committee, and we are currently finalizing dates and times for our personnel to make themselves available to the committee for follow-up inquiries. That last bit is absolutely not true. We are currently finalizing dates and times for our personnel to make themselves available to the committee. No, you're not. Their criminal defense lawyers are doing that. James Murray's written statement does not mention the existence of the privately hired criminal defense lawyers who are now reportedly representing Donald Trump's favorite Secret Service agent, Tony Ornato, who as, as who was the head of Donald Trump's Secret Service detail on January 6th, Bobby Engel, the unnamed, the, who was also in the SUV uh, that day, and the unnamed driver who was in the presidential SUV that day. Donald Trump wanted them to take him to the Capitol to join the attackers of the Capitol on January 6th. 
We here at The Last Word asked two questions of the Secret Service today, just two questions. Question one, has James Murray, the director of the Secret Service, hired his own private legal defense counsel? Question two, did James Murray, director of the Secret Service, preserve his own January 6th text messages on his Secret Service phone? We got the same answer to both questions, which was no answer at all. James Murray's one-page written statement today does not even mention Secret Service text messages. James Murray does not have one word to say to the people of the United States, to the Congress of the United States, to the President of the United States about the Secret Service's deleted text messages. James Murray authorized the deletion of Secret Service text messages after January 6th, when he knew that the Secret Service communications on January 6th had instantly become the most important Secret Service communications in the history of the Secret Service. He knew that when he allowed them to be deleted. James Murray knew they were going to be deleted. James Murray is leaving the Secret Service at the end of next week to become the highly paid director of corporate security for Snapchat. And when he shows up eventually to the January 6th committee to testify under oath, you can be very sure he will then have a very highly paid private criminal defense lawyer. Instead of explaining why he authorized the deletion of the text messages after January 6th, in his written statement today, James Murray said, quote, the men and women of the United States Secret Service are worthy of trust and confidence. We always thought so, until exactly one week ago. And now the Secret Service has a long way to go to be worthy of trust and confidence because James Murray has directed the Secret Service into the worst scandal in Secret Service history that is now the subject of a criminal investigation with Secret Service agents lawyering up. That is how James Murray is going to leave the Secret Service after being appointed director of the Secret Service because Donald Trump's favorite Secret Service agent, Tony Ornato, told Donald Trump to appoint his friend, James Murray, as director of the Secret Service, and you can be sure that there were pledges to Donald Trump from Tony Ornato and James Murray that James Murray would be loyal. The thing Donald Trump demands of anyone that he was appointing, the thing that he demanded from James Comey in a conversation about James Comey's possible continuation as FBI director, and when James Comey did not pledge his loyalty, Donald Trump fired him. So we know. We know what kind of pledges of loyalty Donald Trump exacts in those situations. Did James Murray <clears throat> delete the January 6th test mes text messages on his own Secret Service phone? I have asked that question publicly here on television. And I have asked that question directly to the Secret Service. No answer. In his written statement today, James Murray did the press release equivalent of taking the Fifth Amendment. He refused to say one word about the Secret Service text messages, including his own text messages on January 6th. He used the right to remain silent that criminal defendants have. The dam has begun to break in a way that means we are going to learn much more about the Secret Service text messages that the Secret Service wants to remain secret. Last night, the January 6th committee delivered a full accounting of the 187 minutes during the attack on the Capitol when Donald Trump did nothing to defend the Capitol. But the evidence shows that Donald Trump was not doing nothing. It now shows that Donald Trump was the commander in chief of the insurrection at the Capitol, the commander in chief who wanted to go to the Capitol to join his troops attacking the Capitol. The evidence shows that after a struggle that became physical in the presidential SUV, Donald Trump was returned to the White House where the motorcade spent 45 minutes in the driveway waiting for the final official word that they would not be going to the Capitol. That means Donald Trump spent another 45 minutes in the White House trying to get to the Capitol. In the White House, 
He chose a smaller room than the Oval Office, less accessible to White House staff, to mostly seal himself off from people who wanted him to act as the commander in chief of the United States of America. He sat in the small dining room near the Oval Office and watched the coverage of his insurrection troops on Fox. It was the insurrection version of a president watching the armed services of the United States carry out a mission from the Situation Room. Here's the most famous image of a president of the United States doing exactly that. That's the president of the United States watching his troops in action on the successful mission, mission to get Osama bin Laden. President Obama issued the order to go on that mission, and then all he could do was watch the Navy SEALs in action. On January 6th, Donald Trump was watching the troops who he sent into action. He summoned a mob to Washington. After war, on January 6th, when he knew that the assembled mob was heavily armed and angry, he commanded the mob to go to the Capitol, and he emphatically commanded the heavily armed mob to fight like hell. While Donald Trump was watching his mob fight like hell on television, a mob who he was informed was an armed mob. He already knew that. He was watching them fight like hell on television as he had commanded them to do. Donald Trump took the action of firing a missile into a war zone. Donald Trump sent his 224 tweet. The president said, Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country and our Constitution. Despite knowing the Capitol had been breached and the mob was in the building, President Trump called Mike Pence a coward and placed all the blame on him for not stopping the certification. He put a target on his own vice president's back. They truly latch on to every word and every tweet that he says. And so I think that in that moment, for him to tweet out the message about Mike Pence, it was him pouring gasoline on the fire and making it much worse. That tweet was ammunition for that crowd. That tweet was the equivalent that day of the arms that President Biden is sending to Ukraine for the battle there. Donald Trump did everything he could, possibly could, from the White House to encourage his troops at the insurrection. For the commander in chief of the insurrection, that tweet was a very successful missile strike. The Trump mob after that tweet surged even more forcefully and more violently while Donald Trump remained busy calling senators to try to convince them to overturn the results of the presidential election. He told Mark Meadows that the rioters were doing what they should be doing, and the rioters understood they were doing what President Trump wanted them to do. Donald Trump summoned a violent mob and promised to lead that mob to the Capitol to compel those he thought would cave to that kind of pressure. And when he was thwarted in his effort to lead the armed uprising, he instigated the attackers to target the vice president with violence, a man who just wanted to do his constitutional duty. So in the end, this is not as it may appear, a story of inaction in a time of crisis. But instead, it was the final action of Donald Trump's own plan to assert the will of the American people and remain in power. At the beginning of last night's hearing, Chairman Benny Thompson promised that the committee would prove its case against Donald Trump beyond a reasonable doubt. There can be no doubt that there was a coordinated, multi-step effort to overturn an election overseen and directed by Donald Trump. There can be no doubt that he commanded a mob, a mob he knew was heavily armed, violent, and angry, to march on the Capitol to try to stop the peaceful transfer of power. At the end of last night's hearing, there was no doubt.
as you watch these hearings, I know you have your former student, Merrick Garland, in mind. What are you hoping the attorney general saw in last night's hearing? Well, I believe he saw the culmination of an extraordinary presentation in which there is no conclusion possible other than the one that the very impressive law firm of Barry Burke and Neil Katyal um, present, present, presented on your show just a few minutes ago, namely that the president of the United States deliberately decided that he was going to seize and retain power no matter what. He exhausted all possibilities in terms of going to court. That was fine. But when that didn't work, he developed phony electoral certificates. And when that looked like it was not going to work, he assembled an angry mob. He knew that they were armed. He aimed them at the Capitol. He made sure that the magnetometers were off. He knew that some of the arms were deadly. AR-15s were included. And then, as Merrick Garland undoubtedly watched last night's hearing, we saw the 187 minutes pass in which, as you said, Lawrence, quite powerfully, Merrick watched the commander-in-chief, not of the United States, but the commander-in-chief of an armed insurrectionary mob aimed at the Capitol. And during those 187 minutes, he did everything he could to make sure that they continued on their course. He sent out a tweet making sure that they knew that he thought the vice president was a coward. It was clear that the mob was doing exactly what he wanted. And what I am hoping that Merrick Garland will do is recognize that just as he told the American people in a press conference a couple of days ago, nothing could be more dangerous to the country than not to hold accountable someone who commits the high crime, the serious federal felony of attempting to overturn a democratic election. And I think that at this point, Merrick Garland has only one decision to make, and that is how quickly to move forward. He can wait, and the longer he waits, the more powerful the evidence will be. But the perfect should not become the enemy of the good. I hope that Merrick Garland realizes that time is not on his side and that waiting indefinitely will not be a good idea when the country is on a course that puts it in collision with the survival of democracy. And I think he is going to do what any good attorney general would do, but he's a particularly powerful and, and brilliant one, and that is to organize an indictment that is airtight. He could either go the rather simple course that Barry Burke suggested, charge the easier but quite serious crimes of attempting to obstruct a congressional inquiry, or he could go the more dramatic course that Neil Katyal suggests, and that is sedi seditious conspiracy and inciting and attempting to uh, foment and aid and abet a violent insurrection. He could do all of the, the above. It seems to me that there's no reason to leave, leave anything on the field.